This podcast was proudly brought to you by the Bioceutical Seminar Series, Reprogramming Autoimmunity. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me again in the studio today is Dr. Mark Donahoe. And today we're continuing on part two of chronic fatigue syndrome therapy. Just to recap for the previous episode, we discussed some of the possible factors or causes of chronic fatigue syndrome and the importance of taking a deep family history and how these various factors influence the adaptive response. And we looked at some of the environmental factors which influence the symptoms which present to your practice. So welcome back, Dr. Mark Donahoe to FX Medicine. It's good to be back. And we're here for the hard work today. What, is, <laughs> what does a practitioner actually do? You mean last podcast wasn't hard? My God, my brain's still reeling from that one. There was every sentence you said evoked 20 questions in my head about yeah. what are the possible ramifications of this? Well, that's the bad thing. Evoking <laughs> 20 questions means we haven't answered those questions. And so I, I think we should get into practically, what do you do as a practitioner? What we left open last time, which I was uncomfortable about, was here's how to think about it. Here's adaptive responses, how they can play out. Here's how the endocrine system responds to it and yeah. how you don't treat it directly, but you help the person recover and watch the endocrine response improve. Be before we get into some of these responses, indeed, how we treat, yeah. I, I just want to cover, there's one niggling question that I forgot to ask you in the last podcast. And that was about, we talked about how in the past or some people had a, a lesser aptitude to respond to a stressor. And so they were the meek and mild people, the quote unquote, the weaker ones, right? And yet what I commonly saw in, and I'm not an expert in this, I've seen a few, but in the chronic fatigue sufferers that I saw, they seemed to be the ones that could not put off until tomorrow what they could do today. And indeed that was their undoing. They would not, they refused to learn the, the meaning of the word pace Hmm. They would always do it now. And I remember you covered this once ages ago. You said, well, if you were sick for so long, wouldn't you want to do everything now? Yeah. But I, 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 Look, yeah. there, are, there are a couple of things. Firstly, I don't think these are weaker people. Like evolution no, no, has a, a range of hmm. you know, cap capacities. And if you're in evolutionary terms, if you're the right genetics for the right time, it's like John Howard, the hmm. time is right hmm. for you. At that time, those particular evolutionaries, so the ability to fight infections and do so really vigorously, there are times where that is really valuable. Overfighting is not so valuable. So I didn't want to give you the impression that chronic fatigue syndrome are people inherently weak. They have specific no, no. tendencies and the mismatch between them and their environment or even medical intervention. I remember I talked about susceptibility to infection. The doctors who give antibiotics fix each individual attack but worsen the person in their overall health because those antibiotics have consequences. So often it's not the weakness of the person. Most of those people will march through life in really, really good health. But when they fall off their perch, untangling all the contributions to it is a, is a very, very difficult job. So they're not weak. They, in fact, I, here's one of the paradoxes. We always thought chronic fatigue syndrome, oh, you've got a weak immune system. Rubbish. No. Their immune system is hyperactivated, over-responsive, and just can't leave the fight alone. And part of the job is to t settle that down. It is the overfighting, the immune activation, the, the gluten triggering these kind of immune reactions that sees them in a battle that never, ever ends. And so the adaptation to that never-ending battle is... You go back into your shell, you hibernate a bit, you wait for the thing to finish, and that leads to fatigue. The people I see very, very frequently, they are high achievers, as you mentioned in the last podcast. Right. They overdo it, and yeah. when the time comes to stop, they stretch it a bit further, and then when the crash comes, it's like falling off a cliff. So I used to be constantly frustrated by this. I mean, I remember this lovely guy, um, but I was constantly frustrated when I would see him late at night on a Friday and I'd said, you've done it again, haven't you? Mm. <laughs> and he said, yeah, with a smile on his face, going to feel like crap over the weekend. Right. 
he would not learn that meaning of pace. Yeah. How successful are you at trying to change these people's attitude to how they respond to when they start to get well? Okay. I, I, I must say, I remember one lady who had been through the ringer. This lady was bedridden um, and she was a strong, she was a, like an Amazon woman, an amazing lady, but she was bedridden. And I do remember that she said one of the things that she really had to learn and the thing that got her on the upward hill was that she would ring alarm bells when she said she felt better. And so she would purposefully, gently go for a walk or something like that. In typical way, we're going to start at the <laughs> wrong end, which is when the person is getting better. So what we're going to talk about today is how do you kind of subclassify this a little bit? How do you know which type of person is having which type of response? Mm. But at the end, what you've touched on is when a person is recovering, we the yo-yoing that can occur is not good for the health. By yo-yoing, I mean if you have not been able to do activities for a long period of time and you get a few steps forward, what do you do with that gain? We had a concept yeah. called convalescence in medicine, you know, that you would have an operation, you convalesce in hospital mm. for some mm. time. There is a period at which there is literal recovery of the pathology, and then there is a period of recovering of reserves. And that's kind, to me, that's kind of like the wound repair. You know, the, the first is. two weeks, 70 odd, 80 odd percent of that wound is repaired, but that, the rest yeah. of it takes over a year. And, and in chronic fatigue syndrome, one of the big problems is getting a person to not overdo it yeah. when they get the first signs of their energy back. We even call it the spring cleaning effect. What is the worst thing to do? Oh, the house has been a mess for five years. I now have the energy to clean the house. Well, and so the thing. stirring up of the dust and the cleaning of molds and the using of chlorine and, and they go about doing something and then realize way too late that what they've done is used up the very reserves that they need to recover. Mm. And that yo-yoing effect means we do know that you've got to pace yourself at the end. When you get the first signs of recovery, give it time. Get a benchmark. We, we have this concept of 50 or 60% of your self-assessed maximum is all you should do. The trouble is you don't know your maximum until you've overdone it, in which case it's already too late. So what we do say is at the point of recovery, when you're getting more energy, do simple, very short-term things and watch the next morning. Right. The hallmark of doing too much is what happens the next day, not what happens the day you do it. Yeah, yeah. Adrenaline gets these people through amazing things. Mm, so I see mm. people who are almost bed-bound. They come to see me. They actually travel from, say, Canberra. They come up and I look at them and they're sitting in front of me and they are conversing and telling their story and they're enthused with the possibility of doing some good. But I know and they know that the next three or four days are going to be horrible. Yeah. And now that's something that the normal person doesn't pay a price for. And it also fools a lot of doctors because they say, well, you can't be that bad because you've you know, you traveled here. If you got out of Canberra. Yeah. <laughs> adrenaline does the job of stabilizing. And I am quite clear about that in chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's almost the over-responsive chemical of the body that under adrenaline load, they can do pretty well normal things. But the adrenaline is like a credit card. You've just put something on a credit card with a 50% per day interest rate. You are going to be paying that off over a period of time. So that's an interesting after. analogy that I think patients might learn from. You know, it mm. might be a good teaching aid to talk to them about having a, a credit card with yeah. your health. And you have, if yeah. you put a lot of credit on there, you've got to pay that debt off before yeah. you're on the even keel again. Well, we talk about, you know, the, the kind of currency of energy. People mm. already know that. What mm. happens though is that doctors and practitioners often are enthused at getting people functional again. And we're impatient. What we want to see is, okay, well, you're doing well. And we think if I just kind of talk this up, you'll be feeling a lot better. And I think a lesson for practitioners is always that after you've dealt with chronic fatigue syndrome for a while, the slow and steady recovery at the end gives the thyroid, the adrenals, the whole um, cortisol type hormonal response, gives it time to reset. And typically, that resetting is measured according to the time that the person's been sick. So a person sick for 12 months can reset that in just a matter of weeks. Right. A person who's been sick 25 years, it's going to take yeah. a year. Yeah. And the expectation that once you start to feel better, you are on the other side and you're in the recovery phase is a real trap, I right. think.
And the worst people at this are insurers and employers. They are eternally sending a thing out, is she better yet? Is yeah. she better yet? Yeah. Is she better yet? Quick. What we want is 30 hours of work per week. And when we come back with a, a line which says, let's start at four hours twice a week and see how that goes with rest days in between, mm. there's an impatience. The world moves on at high pace. If that person's going to enter that stream of high pace, it's going to be a year, maybe two years down the line. And we as practitioners have a protection role to play that the person looks as though they're making a move forward. The most dispiriting thing in the world is to get right back into work crash again and they remember what the last one was like and it is terribly dispiriting to them. On the other hand, they were doing something and they need to have some focus of where do I put my effort in now? Put it back into eating well, getting your hours of sleep, doing graduated exercise. When you finally get a bit of energy, go for half the walk mm. you think you can mm. and watch the next morning. And I think that, right. that critical okay. question is how were you the next day, not how were you on the day. Enthusiasm can make a person do things and they'll say, I walked three kilometres. And then bang. And if you say, what was the next day? Oh, it's terrible. Hmm. And hmm. it was three days before I was recovered. That's overdoing it. And we do know that that yo-yoing, that kind of energy utilisation crash, it, it delays recovery in the long term. There's no doubt about that. I have a bit of a problem with that with the chronic fatigue syndrome clinics because you have exercise physiologists who in the early days were just saying, we know that if you push yourself, you will feel better. But it was only 20% of the people that can push themselves without getting worse. So, And they never they were, saw them the next two days. Yeah, I know. And, and the same with specialists who have to assess these yeah. people is the cardiologist will say, well, they look pretty good to me. That is the other aspect of this illness. The person never looks they, as bad no, as they, they are. No, that's right. And How, so, however, I've got to say, there was one... Um, mother who, had, wow, this lady was dedicated mother, but it was her daughter. And I saw photos of, are, are, these photos are indelled in my brain. There was one photo was her and her friend, a young teenage girl jumping up and down on the bed, mm. being foolish. Yay. Time of life, glint in your eye, happy smiley faces. The next one was a sort of, you know, half a smile. Mm. The next one, it was, it was almost, it was almost art yeah. to me. It, it was, there was the girl, she was sitting at the end of a table and there was no smile. There was just this body sitting at the end of a table. And she said, this is what my daughter has been through. Wow. So it was this incredible slow change into a, like a wounded person. It was, yeah. it was just amazingly You're sad. Right. The life goes from the eyes. And I, I mean, when you look oh. into a person, you can tell. Yeah. But it is not the classic things of the dark rings under the no, eyes, the kind of odd colour of the skin when people have acute health problems or when they have chronic pneumonia or chronic renal failure. Or even failure. chronic stuff. Yeah, it's a... So we doctors are very used to seeing people in a very long-term state of lousy health. You see the arthritic kind of yep. moving into the room and you pay a lot of attention to it. And when a person walks in and what they describe doesn't match our preconception, we tend to have a disbelief that yeah. that could be true. What do doctors do? Anything that doesn't fit our model, we put into a thing called psychiatry, which is the absolute nonsense science of medicine. Where It's the, it's the kind of kid in the back room where you say, oh, I don't know how to deal with this. You deal You're with it. You're going to get a mean call from and Professor we Gordon get, Parker. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but the psychiatrists have this luxury of having untestable hypotheses. The, you know, this is that one organ you can't examine the brain, so opinion leads the but field. But you've got DSM. Yeah. Tell me about DSM-5. You know, this is, now we've got um, more diagnoses and less science than we've ever had. But what I think truth, is interesting is that things existed before that don't exist now. Sure. And they, so it's they kind come of like and go, Saturn's gone. I know, they come and go. <laughs> My problem with it is that it validates almost any kind of pharmacological approach and that you can be experimental in one area of medicine without there being any opprobrium, you know, directed at you. You can try drugs that are potentially lethal, suicide-inducing drugs, and never think about why the person is the way they are. And psychiatry oddly sits back and thinks of itself as a science. It's not that it does nothing. It's that what we're doing is manipulating brain chemistry without understanding, in fact, what we're doing and not individualizing it, not having any clue about what's going to happen in an individual. But my problem with psychiatry is it deals with symptoms of the brain and the mind that who do have origins and causes. 
the number of psychiatrists that go back and ask about sleep and the family history and ask about other issues that could be contributing to psychiatric, so-called psychiatric disease or disorders are very few. So the psychiatry profession has largely become the administrator of drugs. I'm really pleased to see psychiatry now emerging from that at our GPC conference just a year and a half ago. We have a group of psychiatrists dropping things around going, did you know diet is able to affect mental function? Did Felice you know Jacker. environment is able Again. to affect mental function? And I'm, in one sense, I'm saying... Uh, this is orthodox. Duh, this is orthodox, like, really? Yeah, this is really super orthodox. This is from the bastions of academia. We have gone too far. There are factors that we have not explored. So I'm happy to see the new professors and associate professors rediscover it. I hate to be the party pooper, but this has been like a hundred years yeah, yeah, or 50 yeah. years at the very least of what was previously called orthomolecular psychiatry. Everything got a bad name, but coming back to how does the world affect the brain and the mind? How does the gut affect the brain and the mind? These have been bloody obvious to people who paid attention. That it's a rising in psychiatry is great. But what is it going to mean when the business of psychiatry is largely the administration of drugs and getting people out and getting them to a new level of function? If there's one group we've let down, it's psychiatric care in this country. So for anybody, any of our listeners wanting to delve into this interesting, I mean, really interesting area, it, to me it's a duh area, but, but it's like it's being validated. Yeah. And it's brilliant work by Associate Professor Felice Jacker and mm. Professor Michael Burke and others in their yeah. group. Um, but there was also a South American researcher looking at how trans fatty acids were a direct cause of depression. Yeah. Um, I can't remember her name. Very, very interesting research though. So I, like I wholeheartedly yeah. <laughs> some, uh, uh, support the, the notion that diet plays a major impact on your I, mind. What I should not have got into then <laughs> is psychiatry. Right? We, we are dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome. But, uh, but my it was concern, called, look, I remember the, the argument on television that you had. And this, this uh, was he a psychiatrist? I'm pretty sure he was. Yeah. And he was adamant that it was psychosomaticism. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. Um, and that's... It, the, is, it is the unwinnable argument, yeah. right? Are people with chronic fatigue syndrome depressed? Of course they are. Hey, wouldn't you be? Are they anxious? Of course they are. Mm. You know, you've been told there's nothing wrong with you. You feel it and every day of mind. your life. Mm. You've been told it's in your mind. You've been on the drugs. So we had a, a story. We had a clinic back in the early 90s, and we took a, a careful history of how many people they'd seen. People before they came to the clinic had seen eight doctors, two of them psychiatrists on average. The problem had been that you can manipulate the brain into almost any state. You can fiddle with the brain. It doesn't mean that you can't, but it doesn't create a recovery from the illness. And so a person being less appreciative of the feelings of depression, that may be good. I have no problems with antidepressants that are used for symptomatic care. I have major problems with people just relabeling a complex illness, depression, and treating it as though depression is a disease all by itself. So I, I still would come back and say... When we are trying to classify fatigue syndrome, it's still important to keep open the idea of traumatic stress of childhood. It's not that you say it can't be psychiatric. It cannot be psychological. There is no stress. It's, it's, a, it, it's it not goes across a whole range yeah. of... And if you question deeply, often what will happen is people who I see after seeing 20 doctors are reticent about talking about their stresses because in previous occasions, every time... You know, was there sexual abuse in childhood? Yes, there was. But, oh, well, that's it. And then the conversation ends and a prescription is written and off they go. Yeah. So in a sense, they're being self-protective by saying, well, that really wasn't the story. You know, I got through that. I've been through psychotherapy. I've, done, I've managed all of that. I still am sick yeah. in this way that does not allow me to function. So I don't, I don't have that high a problem with psychiatry when it recognizes itself as symptomatic care of a person. And sometimes those medications do help and they get a person away from feeling, say, suicidal. But they are like Panadol for headaches. Mm. They do not answer the question of why that is there. So looking at the relevance of, or indeed the evidence of, I'm going to say the word, cognitive behaviour therapy, you will say mindfulness, I get it. But mm. to, to put that label on it, CBT or mindfulness, in treating even major depression now, mm as being as good as pharmacotherapy, yeah. uh, that's a big one. So but they talk to me about the import of using this sort of therapy 
for chronic fatigue sufferers, to get them out of that sickness mentality, if you like? CBT works for people who have cognitive rational minds that fit with that kind of mindset. There, the, It doesn't work for artists. It really doesn't work for artists. There are creative people who have a more complex view of the world, but you can convince the rational, organised mind to go and pay attention and treat things rationally. And that fits within their concept, and CBT works for many of those people. My experience with it is it doesn't work for long. Right. Right? That that is a okay. thing which can allow you to say, I will deny symptoms, this is really only a feeling, and it brings it back up to a mental function. But when the underlying processes are left, when the immunology, inflammation, and when those kind of problems are continuing, all that's happening is there's a delay before the breakthrough occurs in somewhere else. So I don't, I don't, I don't fight against it. There are clinics that do a lot of good. Talk therapies do it. Interestingly, countries that do not have our mental health services seem to do better with mental health than we do. So the medicalizing of mental health has not been one of our great successes. It really is back to community care, abandon people, and if they don't take the drugs, what do you do next? Yeah. And so I, I don't think that we've got a great system. I know that we keep on saying CBT, but CBT honestly means anything to anybody who's doing it. There is mindfulness-based cognitive therapies. There's like 42 variations of this, and any or all of them can play a part in helping. I don't. I, I still think we needed to get back to chronic fatigue syndrome. What does a practitioner do? You've got to deal with the fact that they've been to psychiatrists. They're often on some or one or more psychoactive medications. In fact, one of the reasons that people see me, one of the main reasons is they're sick of the drugs. Yeah. It's not the them that they were. They want to get off the drugs and they want their fatigue syndrome managed in a different way. So all they are is undepressed chronic fatigue syndrome. What they want to do is get to a cause. Do you find that, uh, I know this is a broad brushstroke, but do you find that particular types of antidepressants seem to work better, like the MAOIs versus the SSRIs versus the SNRIs? Nope. No, I, don't, I haven't found any pattern. And in fact, the psychiatrists that treat people just go through a checklist and they each of try them has one. their different orders. Yep. And if you see the chronic fatigue syndrome guidelines, it says, try one of the list of the following. I can't wait until we get to a work, stage where we can tease this one. apart with genetic snips or something. Yeah. I can't and, wait for the day where, where psychiatry can be personalised in medicine in their pharmaco Psychiatry choices. becoming a science would be, would be you know, like the <laughs> You are so mean to psychiatrists. I, I am. Not that psychiatrists are bad, but the conceptual framework of it is there's a broken brain with neurotransmitter defects that we are going to fix because we have a pill on the outside. So, well, I do admit, back in my day of nursing, I remember in the early days, at least, it was called a benzodiazepine receptor. Yeah. It wasn't called um, a... a, a an adenosine receptor, oh. a GABA receptor, sorry. Yeah, we call it what we want, the cannabinoid receptors and the narcotic yeah, receptors. We, we, give everything, we give everything That was until Ruth Cracknell had, had a go. Yeah. I don't really want to go down that path. The, the thing that I think is useful for a practitioner is if you have a person present with chronic fatigue syndrome, you do not need to take them off psychiatric medications. You don't need to. It's not a philosophical fight, despite what I'm saying here. People are often better on the devil that they know than changing to the devil that they don't know. Yep. And one of the problems with fatigue syndrome or chronic fatigue syndrome in particular is the brain and the mind is affected and the adaptive response is impaired. So too rapid a reduction of a psychiatric medication is in fact terrible news. And that's one of the reasons that they stay on it is they perpetually try and just stop it. And stopping uh, a medication which is active in the brain and doing it suddenly is not a good news for a person in a very tenuous adaptive response. So I tend not to do that, nor do I get people off their cigarettes. I have people who are smokers. There are good medical things to do, but the timing is everything. Right, yeah. And the timing at a time in the future where they are now well, confident and rebuilding their health, these medications are easy to stop at that time, very difficult to stop when they're sick. When they come in, though, what's important is to say, well, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, but which flavor of yeah, it? Yeah. What's the type of thing that we're dealing with here? When I said on the last occasion, I have this Gemini, the genetics is something that the family history that we talked about last time, but you can also do the testing. You can do the methylation SNPs, and more and more we're building up this library of, like, if there's a Compt SNP, then the response to maybe adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine is impaired. 
we're starting to build a picture, but it is very blurry. I, I know this again, broad brush, but do you find a, an interesting, let's say, um, association between various types of SNPs and chronic fatigue? Oh, I do. Like comp? I do. I mean, here's the... Here's the... Comp time I put in for our, our listeners um, doesn't just work on sex hormones like estrogen, but also very importantly works on things like um, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Yeah. Uh, and so the ability to do the methyl transferase, the catecholaminomethyl transferase, is a method of detoxifying yourself to adrenaline. Mm. And if you don't do it, the adrenaline plays out, the anxiety, the depression that can be secondary. We have our kind of cascades of, well, that sets off a glutamate response. And the glutamate response brings on, and so we have our concepts of the cascades that occur. But I do find that there's a value of knowing with each person what is your methylation looking like? Yeah. What are your DQ genes looking like? Since um, uh, Richie Shoemaker was here, what does the DRB1 look like? Can we, from the genetics, predict something? And if our prediction matches what happened to you, then that's a pretty powerful entry point. So I think Richie Shoemaker's view of, let's have a look at these predictors. Did the person who is highly mold susceptible end up in a mold affected house? Well, there's something that says there was a predisposition. So you have to match up the patient predisposition to the actual exposure. Yeah. And so what I Two do now is I see people with their history. We do those genetic type of tests. And so you get, say, DQ2. The DQ2.5 is a strong predictor of a higher likelihood of an inflammatory response to a gluten component called gliadin. And even gliadin, what people forget is every grain has gluten. Every grain. It's the nature of it. However, there are particular types of gliadins in wheat, rye and barley that are extraordinarily commonly reactive to people with these DQ2.5. Can you go over that again? You said every grain, Every rice. grain has gluten. Rice. They are different types of glutens. And so when we talk about gluten, we are talking about the reactive glutens. But the prolamines, the little things which are, um, are proline and glutamine, which are tiny little capsules of protein that are in all these grains, vary from grain to grain. So we're talking about alpha gliadin versus other? Not even that. This is a sub-sub-subunit. The, the real thing that is reactive, the stuff that uh, Alessio Fasano and others deal with, are called prolamines. Mm. And all that they are is highly acid and alkali resistant components that provide nutrients for every single grain. They vary in their structure. Some are highly reactive to people with DQ2 or DQ2 or DQ8 genes, and some are not. So that's why you have pretty well everybody with gluten reactivity, wheat, rye, and barley is it. For about 10 or 20%, oats and corn are it. For around about 1 or 2%, even rice can be reactive because really? of the cross-reactivity. Right. There are high gluten reactive uh, quinoas. Most of those we don't get over here. So it is, it's a more complex story. We said, first of all, it was gluten. Yeah. Every grain has gluten. You have glutinous rice. That's why it's called glutinous rice, right? Well, you, you actually get... so I thought it was called glutinous rice purely because it was sticky, yeah, not because is. it contained gluten. It is. But every grain, the nature of every grain wow. is every grain contains gluten. The gluten is not the thing we react to. That's the common name we give to the reactive components. And it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. So if you understand that every grain has gluten... There are variations of gliadins, and a subunit of the gliadin is these prolamines. And the reactivity, the immune reactivity, is not to these big molecules. It's to the tiny little subfractions, which are called the prolamines. So, so the prolamines vary from grain to grain. Every one of them has a subtly or significantly different type. Just to get this clear in my mind, because I'm still confused. Right. You're saying gluten but then you're talking about a subfraction. But if you yeah. change the subfraction, kind of like a hormone, you change one stick, that's not gluten anymore. That's... No, it's, it's gluten. They're all still gluten. So that's mm. the thing. It took me, you know, two years to really oh, get Oh, good. I'm not this. just right. slow. No, it took me two, <laughs> Give years me two years because what we have is we have the common term, I'm gluten sensitive. Is there any gluten in my diet? Yeah, yeah. The common use of this term is a little bit like the use of the term allergy. I'm allergic to gluten. Yeah. Are you really allergic or is it an immune reaction or is it a neurological reaction? Yeah. We use common terms, and so the term gluten just became associated with, well, we saw gluten, it was reactive, and so we called it gluten reactivity. Everything has gluten, and so then we said, oh, that's actually gliadin, which is a subfraction of that. We're, we're now at the point where we understand that the gliadins vary because the prolamine component of those gliadins has different immune reactivities. And so it's important to say, for most people, you use the term gluten to just mean wheat, rye, barley. 
you don't have to think too much about all the And yet some people react to oats, some people yep. don't. And some people react to rice in the similar right. way as well. Okay. And so I've seen all shades and variations of this can, over the last 10 years. Apart practice. from being in a lab, can you measure those prolamines? And no, Easily? I mean, the prolamines just get different names, so there's not particularly a need to measure the prolamines. They, they occur in every grain. So every grain has to seed. Every seed has to form a new grain. The prolamines are an essential part of life, and gluten is the carrier protein. So are, are the prolamines still there once you've sprouted this, or is that the old yeah, sprouting? Yeah, well, that's, that's the area that Alessio, I mean, we've talked about this. I got a chance to talk with him. I don't know about that. There's some point at which the prolamines become the kind of fossilized components of what's going to survive almost anything, stomach acid or any other bloody thing, it, a high alcohol is about the only thing that dissolves them, but it's got to be 40% Woo-hoo. before you get to any dissolution of that. And what we are finding now is that there are some bacteria, even bacteria in the mouth, that if you chew properly, denature the prolamines. And so part of the value of chewing may be that mouth bacteria that are particularly good at breaking down these prolamines, these tiny little highly reactive molecules, there may be much more value than just the, you know, the amylases and the proteases and the like. Some of the bacteria, the eubiotics of the mouth, do the job of breaking down those gluten components for us. I, I wonder if there's just this cautionary note of, you know, the next blaming thing of, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, I, uh, and, a part, uh, and, and by the way, I, I'm not espousing, never would I espouse that everybody should start to p- p- imbibe a, a good reposado tequila with 40% alcohol no. or stro rum. <laughs> this is why they put <laughs> the, room, the worms in them to denature the, the gluten that the, that the worm has eaten. But I do just wanted to separate that because... We as practitioners know wheat, rye, and barley are the big buggers. Then we simply say to people, get those out. And you've got gluten that's out the of your diet. Measurable. And we have to live with that dual term that gluten is a broad term wow. covering all grains. But when we're t- using it according to human health, we're meaning the gluten that contains the, patrol- the prolamines of wheat, rye, and barley. I have plenty of oats reactive people as well, fewer corn reactive people, and rarely we get rice and others. See, corn was lambasted. Oh, it's gone. It's not as prevalent as what we'd like to no. think. But there are some who have a real issue. Yeah, and, and those this people is my write problem books. with people who think this all or none principle, yeah. the switch mentality. Yeah. And when it's, people who are corn reactive write books and say never, ever touch corn, that does a disservice to other people. People are different. So you're touching here on antigenic ambivalence. Yeah. Okay. So this is something that um, Dr. Mick Lyon right. first um, educated me about. And that was basically unless you have a real need, like an anaphylactic reason to um, avoid. to avoid. And that's a totally other question from the work of, is it Professor Mimi Tang on oh, uh, right. curing peanut anaphylaxis right. um, by giving minute amount of peanuts in a medical facility. Um, but that's another, and that's another topic. But God, do we get dragged off <laughs> I know, there is by your but, brain. But um, that's your fault. But, right. but um, Dr. Mick Lyon taught me first about there is some import in having in not challenging to give a to invoke a response, but basically just a, a slight exposure, a small exposure to these foods to which one is sensitive mm-hmm. to, so that they don't their body doesn't forget that. And Mike Ash solidified this. He said, if you don't do that, if you start to avoid one food, then the next food, then the next food, you eventually end up on the right. as the mashed potato and peas brigade. These I, are the people look, that have been on, through I would They're still emaciated. separate things here. There are yeah, okay. sensitivities and reactivities, yep. and there is genetics of... So the DQ2.5 does see wheat, rye, and barley prolamins. It allows the immune system to see them as a type of enemy, almost yep. as if they were pathogens. The other thing is peanut allergy, where you have antigen exposure and desensitization or desensitization is an act of, you know, changes over time. I think they're very different things. But is that not terrain? Is that not governed by terrain? It is. However, you not, if you can tell... Can you not reduce that sensitivity? Well, you can, uh, but here's the thing. Say you get uh, a celiac person, you do it by maybe introducing parasites or worms. That does something which changes gut reactivity mm. but may not change autoimmune reactivity. What I'm saying is in the genetics, we have little peaks into, if I had to guess what you were going to react to, what would it be? Yeah. And for those people where the genetics point to gluten and in the common term of wheat, rye, barley, maybe corn and maybe oats, 
then it's a sensible practitioner thing to say, I'm not going to get into the details of it. Come off that and let's see how you go. Is gluten an essential part of life? It is not. Vegetables, fruits, meats, the rest of the things, we do not have, we're not grass grazers. Mm -hmm. We have grasses as a means of maintaining something. We generally speaking do reasonably well with them because it allowed us to store food during winter time and use a, use a different food source. And it means all the highly gluten reactive people probably never made it. But, but, but I'm I saying know, from a practitioner viewpoint, yeah. if you could, if you know the DQ genetics, if you know the DRB1 and you're able to say, well, you're likely to be mold reactive, you're likely to yeah. be uh, chronically reacting to infections, you're low MSH, it gives us a categorization which says, what is your susceptibilities? Did you now run into that thing that makes you sick? Mm. That's the second question of what's the environmental, nutritional, dietary or other causes. We don't have good genetics for are you susceptible to post-traumatic stress no, or are you susceptible right. to something Yet. or other? They're too far, too complex in their interactions. But we can undo a couple of the little bits and say, if I just take everyone off gluten, that's probably a reasonable thing to do. But if I know the 15% who are highly likely to be reactive and they're sick and they're eating the stuff, my odds of doing good with that group by getting them off their gluten are really high. Mm -hmm. If I know that you're a mold reactor, and the story is you were well until your, you know, your home leaked and you ran into the mold spores and then your health just disintegrated, then I have a categorizing which says, yeah, that was your nemesis. Yeah. You ran into For your nemesis. You. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that thing, and, and it is, it also does play out in families that mm. the high likelihood is that the mum, if they've got kids that are also getting sick, the genetics are likely to be similar to those people. So I think the genetic side of what the practitioner can do is unravel, are you a poor methylator? Are you a compt? Are you DQ2, DQ8? Are the DRB1s, do they give us a hint about yeah. this? And I think one future of our community in integrative care is to know the predispositions of people. Once that becomes a simple test that we can all do all of the time rather than bits and pieces and cobbled together in this way, I think what we'll have is, here's your trajectory, keep away from the following. Yeah. And that's preventive in a way that we're unable to do now. Now we see a person sick and we go back and say, were you susceptible? It's literally too late. So what we need is a test that takes in these quite varied parameters, really, yep. um, that we should, you know, I, yeah. I don't know how you do that, but anyway. Well, also the final thing is you've got to line them up together, right? So for yeah. plenty of these people, they are, you know, Lewis non-secretors and their methylation, poor methylation and they're gluten reactive, and they still get to 25 in perfect health mm. because youth is very, very forgiving. Mm -hmm. And until something goes wrong, the thyroiditis is the classic one of, uh, you know, 32 year old, 34 year old female that everything's going along fine. They don't notice that there's anything wrong, but they're developing a low-grade autoimmune disorder. The thyroid is gradually slowing down, and when it reaches a particular point, that inflamed gland is no longer doing the job for them. And so that's a good example for th low-grade thyroiditis. The TSH is perfectly normal. Their metabolic rate is low, and they've been winding down for a while, but youth was the thing that kept them above board for that time. The Epstein-Barr virus people frequently you find that they had chronic, say, allergies or skin problems. They were the wrong person to get that virus, mm. but it took a stress of a high school certificate to provide the fertile field for yeah. them to get sick at that time. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the genetics. I'm a big fan of the environment and saying what met the wrong genetics. Mm -hmm. And we see chronic fatigue syndrome is still only around about one to 2% of the population so it's the rare person that lines up a few of the, say, methylation DQ genes, and you say, well, that was the wrong environment for you. That's why you got sick at that time. Now, what kept you sick? And that thing of the rolling on the chronic inflammatory responses of Richie Shoemaker, we can look at immunology, and I'll give a hint right now. I, I look regularly at the helper suppressor, the lymphocyte surface markers, see routinely high helper suppressor ratios, you know, values that typically are around about 1.3 to 2.5. And we see four, five, six, seven, eights, and they're regularly very high. And it looks like there's an acute infection, but it's not. The helper cell numbers are normal. The suppressor cells have disappeared. Right. Where are they? They're in the gut. And what happens is when you change the gut around and the one in 10 cells in the gut is a suppressor T lymphocyte, mm -hmm. its job is to turn off overreactions on the gut wall. If they get sucked out of the bloodstream, you get this high helper suppressor ratio. We think, oh, that's active infection. It's not. 
it's the cells are doing their job on the gut wall. They get, because of the huge surface area of the gut, they're taken out of the circulation and leave you susceptible to other infections. How do you measure that? Well, all you need to do is look at the helper suppressor ratio. And when the but, suppressor but, cells have but gone you're very looking low, at serum. Yeah, we do blood. So it's not as, I mean, these are white cells, so yeah. you don't use But serum. you're looking at blood, that tells you it's not there. How do you differentiate between active infection and it's... Well, because in active infection, the helper cells rise really high. And so you get a high helper suppressor because helpers go very high and the suppressors are quite normal. And that happens in the first stage of a flu. You can get a, a high helper suppressor ratio because there's activation of immunity. The problem for these people is not that. It's the loss of suppressor cells. They are left in a position where they're trying to put out fires through the gut wall, strongly associated with increased intestinal permeability. When things are getting through the gut wall, you've got fires going on all the time over a big surface area. What should we be measuring there then? Intestinal well, permeability or I think, suppressor cells? Well, I think both of them. So when I see the very low suppressor cell numbers, I do the lactulose mannitol test. I, you know, I'm thinking of moving on. What do we know about zonulin? It's less well characterized at the moment, but a combination of stool zonulin uh, along with blood zonulin levels probably is going to be helpful in that. There's a lot of pathology. I know. But when you give people the lactulose and mannitol and you see the sugars go right through those gaping holes in the gut wall and yeah. coming out in the urine, you know that things are getting through. Antigens can get through that gut, which will trigger these immune responses. That allows us to focus on the gut, for example. Yep. And I see that as very different from the Epstein-Barr virus where gut pathology is trivial. They've got lymph nodes that are up in their throat, red sore throat, and they've got high helper suppressor ratios, but that's because helpers are high and their battle is going on. So I do divide those off in different ways. To me, if we had something that I would love to be able to do, it would be to look at what's going on in the brain. What is that neuroinflammatory response, which comes back to David Hussey mm -hmm. and the QEEG, and it, it also comes back to Richie Shoemaker and the, the neuroquant testing, the ability to measure the size of different areas of the brain. But given that the FDA and the NIH in America have come around and said, look, there's evidence of neuroinflammation. It plays out in a different way in people with fatigue syndromes, but we should be concentrating on suppressing the inflammation that's going on in the brain. That's why I said on the last episode, the concept of myalgic encephalomyelitis is in fact back again, that we call, talk about chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, CFS, and we are saying there is evidence of inflammation in the brain. The guesswork early on of ME was, wow, well, there's no inflammation in the brain because they'd be dead. There is a lower grade inflammation that seems to be vagus nerve mediated and it seems to be related to the gut. And if you get the gut right and the brain is recovering, that's one way of getting better. If you get a virus right, I mean, often the simple thing for the kids is zinc acetate lozenges is suppress viral replication in the throat. Sometimes all you really need is something that suppresses a virus long enough for their immune system to catch up. And that's, that works much, much better for people with, you know, just purely post-viral syndromes. Zinc acetate? Zinc gluconate? No, the zinc acetate. It's the acetic acid. It's the acetate that does the job. The zinc's the irrelevant part of it. So there is viral inhibition because of the acetate component, not the zinc component. Zinc acetate was given with the idea that the zinc might help stop viral replication. But when they used it with magnesium and other salts, it was the acetate component. Because zinc was... acetate is used in Wilson's disease, isn't hmm. it? Yeah. Uh, zinc acetate, is it? Yeah, it's a so. delivery method for zinc. Yeah. But it, is, so. it, has, it has a viral inhibitory hmm. factor. Hmm. And so we have tools as practitioners that if we can subclassify a little bit, if we stop thinking of it as chronic fatigue syndrome, and we can say, here's your genes, here's your nemesis that you ran into, pull that out. No matter what you say about treatment, getting rid of the thing that made a person sick is a lot better than giving them treatments and allowing them to sit in their mouldy homes and environments or we, continuing to eat bread. We need to get on to some more practical hints and tips with treatment. But before I do that, you did this beautiful segue for a question that I've been champing at the bit to ask you since part one. And that is that beautiful diverse nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, the yeah. vagal nerve. What do you think the facility, the usefulness is of cranial nerve stimulation in chronic fatigue? 
I wish I knew. Like, I think it works. I, I think it is really a useful do thing do to it? do. Uh, and I know I've heard chiropractors talking about, you know, the pinner of the ear or, or the little uh, nubbin at the beginning of the ear. There may be ways of changing vagal nerve tone just simply by electromagnetic means. I wish I knew more about it. I have a sense that a lot of what we do with amygdala reconditioning and all of those things, in fact, works on a much broader so-called autonomic nervous system. We don't. We really don't understand. I mean, neuropsychiatry actually wraps like an electrode around the nerve, doesn't it? Mm. And they stimulate. And sure. It's. It. I mean, seriously, it looks like a, one of those um, parasites out of a sci-fi movie wrapping around your backbone. It was. Whoa. <laughs> you you can do things with the vagus nerve, but what we ideally want is to stop the increased vagal tone to stop the two-way communication. So if we, for example get back to people with high choline signals on the MRI scans, evidence of neuroinflammation, and you massively treat the gut, you throw all guns at the gut, and you stop the vagus nerve stimulation that keeps going, you do see the neuroinflammation settle. So you don't have to treat the brain. I mean, people have come up, oh, Celebrex works on the brain. What we're finding is pretty well everything has a part to play in mm. neuroinflammation in the brain. Mm. One thing that we in theory want to do is stop the glutamate type of hyper-responsiveness. We want to calm things down, give the glial cells a bit of a chance to catch up and not have that pro-inflammatory kind of neurological impairment that people describe as lousy memory, lousy concentration, all the fatigue syndrome processes. It would make sense if neuroinflammation was the best descriptor of what we have. But what we're searching for is what has an anti-neuroinflammatory effect. A lot of the things that Dave Hussey brought up at the conference, a lot of things that, uh, uh, that Andrew Heyman brought up at the conference this year, have a settling effect on that neuroinflammation. So the exciting part of the FDA request for people to start putting forward ideas on control of neuroinflammation the ginsenicides, um, some of the curcuminoids, what do they do? They get in there, they change around that neuroinflammation, they settle down the glial nerves, and what we're seeing is they extinguish post-traumatic stress response responses in the brain. So who knew that the recent research just here in Australia is curcumin has an effect on extinguishing the post-traumatic stress type responses in animals, rats and the like. So we, we have tools to play with these. What we have from, you know, the very seminars that we've been to at Biocuticals is people who are definitely into where is the neuroinflammation, where is the gut inflammation, how do you manage the vagus nerve? And I think that's the part where we go for diet, we go for sleep, we go for lifestyle. Each of them is showing its colors in resettling and resetting the balance between the over-response and the under-response. We have anti-glutamates. You know, you can use things like glycine, magnesium. Magnesium is so mm. much loved by our practitioners for very good reasons. It works on everything from the muscles to... BDNF. Uh, yep, uh, BDNF. And, and energy supply in the muscles. And it is a really good example of something that these days I say to people, irrespective of their symptoms, just give a trial of around about three to 400 milligrams of elemental magnesium while we wait for these test results to come mm. back. Mm. I also do put them on, you know, the very high dose probiotics, the Saccharomyces and the stewed apple. I know I always have to mention that, but I've routinely done that. Sorry, had to. Yes, you had to. <laughs> but I routinely do that because these are really safe things to do. And the number of people who come back after the very first consultation and say, well, that's settled X. Yeah. Now but I still y. have yeah. Y. Yeah. And that allows us to get rid of, or not to get rid of, but to say, okay, well, we've partially managed something there. The number of people who improve on magnesium, and we'll never let it go because every time they stop it, they get around four or five days before things go backwards mm -hmm. again. Um, that still begs the question of where's the magnesium going? What's happening? It's being lost from the tissue. So there's something going wrong with maybe the ATP and the pumping action and the ability to keep it in there. But that mindset of, Take chronic fatigue syndrome and think of it as mind and brain, immunology, gastroenterology. The, um, the endocrine system is just making sense of yeah. that. So all the abnormalities we see on the endocrine system just provide a bit of color to that picture. And I'm not a fan of going in and treating the endocrine. If I can prove, you know, if the TSH is seven or eight or nine, then doing something with the thyroid has absolutely proven value. If it's in the low TSH and you just run in and rev up the thyroid, people get sicker. Yeah, they yeah. feel more energy, but they say, I'm getting sicker. Mm. 
And you can then say, well, that's the body that's wound down that response. What um, Andrew Heyman said, you know, be careful of interpreting cortisol. Is high cortisol a good thing? If it's an adaptive response and you try and do something to settle that down, you're not doing the person no, a favor. Right. If it's low and that's the least worst thing that the body can manage and you say, I know how to stimulate your adrenals, then that's no favor either. And so to me, I think the magic of chronic fatigue syndrome management is if you think of the brain mind and the gut as a one thing coordinated by a massive vagus nerve and the immunology as one of the things that can trigger at either end of those, then you're playing with a limited number of variables. You can do something to manage the gut. You can do something to settle immunology. You can aim for particular viruses or pathogens if you know that they're there. And I'm a big fan of parasite management in the gut. Most people, not that big an issue, but for fatigue syndrome, that low-grade gut inflammation is really critical to recovery. So I, I divide them up that way. We've got tools for the brain, We've got tools for immunology. We've got a lot happening in the gut where I think the next five years is going to be really amazing for a lot of the people who suffer the persistent fatigue related to gut inflammation. You mentioned ginsenicides before, and, and of course, this is a, 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 a little bit flippant and simplified, oversimplified term for ginsengs, the panax. Yes. Um, and there are also the other ones which we call ginsengs, which aren't the withania, the yes. eleutherococci. Eleutherococci, Eleutherococcus, cheapest. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a lot of <laughs> Siberian ginseng, yeah. then you're probably Eleutherococci. Yeah. yeah. I guess where I'm going here is the beautiful action of American ginseng. I know. With, uh, uh, and I like to slightly use it with Korean ginseng, the Panax ginseng. Yeah. You know, the, there was a, a an old we like to sort of put these things in boxes, in labels. And there was this old thing about Panax is the stimulating. Yeah. And it was... And I Siberian's do, the adaptive. Yeah, and, and I and do much find that American is more like a mind, quote unquote, ginseng. Right. And there is some research on that with like ADHD kids and things like that. But I do find it's actually it's really interesting. What I think is interesting though is... I know this is getting off CFS, but it's to demonstrate a point about the energetics of ginseng. And um, um, American ginseng, Panax quinquefolius, 2,000 milligrams, was used very well by uh, Deborah Barton and her group uh, presented at the ASCO, forgive me, is it 2011? That's the American Society You're of forgiven. Clinical Oncology. And we're looking at cancer fatigue, cancer-related mm. fatigue. And over two months, it, it bettered dexamethasone. So right. there's your steroid. Yeah. Um, over one month it didn't, but over two months it did. What was remarkable it was that it was extremely safe. So here's something that chronic fatigue patients can use that is extremely safe. Yeah. Um, it works on do. their mind and their energy. Yeah. You combine it with some Panax, maybe some astragalus, astragalus, membranaceous, um, and some other herbs which might help your immune system or nourish your immune system. And I just find these things are beautiful for these chronic fatigue This is patients. why I keep on saying when I finish medicine, <laughs> I'm becoming a herbalist. There is something about the complexity and the adaptogenic capacity of herbs that is far superior in my mind to what happens with the drug therapies that we're on. It's doing something, but it's allowing for biology to participate in all the molecules that are familiar to it. And so I do, I do have a big, I am a big fan of the herbs. For adaptogens, I'm also a big fan of acupuncture. Yes. Right? Acupuncture, I keep on saying, well, your adrenals need to be supported. They go to an acupuncturist and say, oh, no, it's liver spleen or it's something else. So they say, oh, it's not my adrenals. I don't care what the naming is. When I see the adrenals overstretched and not able to manage, the acupuncture does something which is very consistently very useful for the person. And it's entirely dependent on the experience of the acupuncturist. The quick needling that goes on in some places, nothing happens. Right. But a real acupuncturist seems to have a capacity to feel the pulses, to know something about that. The last thing I'd say, just, I, I want to just give one final context for CFS, and that is something you remember a guy called William Vader years yes, ago, died years, years ago. ago, and a really good mate of mine. He gave me this analogy. And, you know, it was, I did something and the person got no better. I did something else, the person got no better. I finally did intravenous vitamin C and they well. And so it's the vitamin C that worked. And he came up with this idea of a boat with many anchors. 
that if there is four anchors down there and you pull up one and nothing moves, you do not throw it back. It's not a useless thing to have done. You've got to have that conceptual framework of there is gut mind immunology, the endocrine's doing its best to adapt. When you're doing things right, you manage the allergies, you manage the diet, you get the sleep back, nothing happens for a long period of time. The final anchor is always impressive. Mm. And the final thing that you do, you say, okay, well, I'm on herbs, I've had acupuncture. Oh, I've moved. Or we have, you know, an antimicrobial down on the gut wall that does something to kill off the bug at the very end. We get impressed with what happens last. But the thing that I'd say is the hard work of chronic fatigue syndrome is identifying what threw the anchors over and pulling them up one at a time. And what we're getting is tests that allow us to know what effort we should put in, not what cures chronic fatigue syndrome. The four components of one person may be utterly different from the one or two things you do for somebody else. And the history, the testing, the genetics, the environment, the diet are the difference between those two people. And that's the hard work, just getting the to almost be empathetic with the person and know where the broken points are and pull the anchors up. That's mixing my metaphors, but pull those anchors up one at a time. They're getting better, even though for a while mm-hmm. they don't notice a difference. And when they get the last one up, they blame you and say, oh, thank you. That X that you gave me last was the, was the thing yeah. that cured me. Yeah. Their perception of it is, shouldn't be the same as ours. We're doing the job of doing the things that are right for their health, allowing for adaptation to leave it, uh, leave the person alone for them to get back to resilient function. Given the many anchors, are there any, let's say, favourite types of things, supplements oh, of that, course. You, that you of course, like, tend to rely on more commonly? There's none. Phosphatidyl serine, I was going to ask about that. I don't use it all that much, and I should. Uh, each of us has our little toolkit. I, I manage, I'm finding that effective gut management is the hardest thing to do, but the most rewarding in the long term and results in the longest term improvements in outcome. I'm fiddling around a lot more with what do we know that settles neuroinflammation, that allows for recovery of short-term memory. Some of them are drug therapies, but the typical ones that we fall back on will be, say, phosphatidylserine, even in that category, magnesium. Curcuminoids? We've got curcuminoids, absolutely curcuminoids, the omega-3 fatty acids. Another one that works very well for some people, not for everyone, is N-acetylcysteine, right. the NAC. NAC, yeah. And we talk of it now in psychiatric terms, oh, it may act as an antidepressant. It has an anti-neuroinflammatory effect. I'm busting to try the things that uh, Andrew Heyman and others have talked about with RG3 and the, and the, you know, the highly potent ginsenicides. But in truth, there's a niggling part of me that says that's not right. That's mm. the kind of drug approach to I want the active from ginseng rather than I'm prepared to give this person time and we're on a journey of recovery. And each step along the way, I see, for example, you'd manage the gut, the liver function abnormalities, the transaminases that are just out of whack, they get better. As they get better, the person feels a little better. When they've been really good for a period of time, their cortisol levels normalize, their thyroid levels, the TSH normalizes, and you know that in the next six weeks, that person is going to be feeling better. And it's a, it's a wonderful journey to watch. I watch the endocrine system more than interfere with it. I don't think that I'm a big fan of intervention in the endocrine system because I generally have found I push a person in a direction that their body was not selecting and it fights back against Mm, me. mm, mm. And so I've tended not to do that and I've tended to do the things and if anyone, if anything, people complain, you're not doing enough. I'm taking it very seriously because I in plenty of occasions have done enough and made it, made people really, really sick and I'm not prepared to do that too often. So I take my time, tick off the little wins that I get along the way And when the endocrine responses are normalizing, then I know the body's back in its normal adaptive state again. So, you know, a a protocol for chronic fatigue patients is is nonsensical. These patients are so diverse in their causality, their indeed their life events, that you can't make a protocol. But a guideline, look at the history, look at the gut, look at their immune assaults and their stressors in life. And then once you get to a stage, you can manage the gut manage the stressors to some degree, help not stimulate, help or nourish their immune system and 
when all of this sort of thing is done. Manage their environment generally yeah. so that they are as adapted to their environment as they can be. It sometimes means reconsidering work, study, um, getting sleep hours right. Really, really critically important. If they are sleeping their eight or nine hours and they're getting good restful sleep, they start to wake up with a bit of energy. Yep. CFS people normally wake up, they're terrible Tired, yeah. in the morning. So the re-establishment of the environment to match the, the person while working on the person to match the environment, that combination of those is, I think, 75% art and understanding the person and getting into their kind of mind, body and history. And then picking off the little anchors, just one at a time. There's another one that we can do something about. And as you do that, they move towards health and you can watch those markers. You watch the liver markers, the immune markers, the suppressor cell numbers. You watch the symptoms of psychiatric disease just evaporate. And that's the beauty of the managing of CFS. It's not one treatment. It's not a protocol. It's here's the areas it plays out in. Here's the tools we have to gently push that person back into an adaptive state. I know we bit off way too much to yeah. try and consolidate three yeah. decades of work of speciality into two podcasts an hour long each odd um, but I, I can't thank you enough for giving us at least the, the basic premises the foundations mm. to learn from and, and 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 at least to work on testing history taking monitoring and judicious in, interventions along with lifestyle management yeah. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. And, and hopefully this gives both our practitioners out there looking after these patients and indeed those patients that might be listening as well. Enough, it's all I can like say, information, a map, yeah. enough yeah. of a map to be able to weigh that final anchor and float off into yeah. the sunset of their, their life in the future. So and, I can't and, thank you enough, Dr. And Michael. then still, when they bring that final anchor up to puddle off slowly <laughs> enough so that they do not over rim. Yeah. So that final step is when all that work is done, there's still the recovery time and that remembering that that recovery time can be quite significant is so important. Can't thank you enough for taking us through that. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark Donahoe. My pleasure again. This is FX Medicine and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This podcast was proudly brought to you by the Bioceutical Seminar Series, Reprogramming Autoimmunity.